Stuart Brown's play, in which he cites neuroscientific research demonstrating that play enhances learning by connecting disparate brain centers. And, and we know that it works. So our students played two games on the French Revolution, as I said. First, a role-playing game in the Reacting to the Past series, which uh, Professor and uh, Class Associate Dean Gretchen Galbraith pioneered a couple years ago here at GBSU. In Reacting to the Past games, students are assigned roles with victory objectives, and in order to win, they have to do library research, close reading, public speaking, uh, persuasive writing, problem solving, collaboration, everything uh, that we've always dreamed of our students doing. That's what the games would trick them into uh, doing and, and wanting to do. Mm. Students also played a video game, Assassin's Creed Unity by Ubisoft. We asked our students, um, and this was on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. So we asked our students to play one or two hours a week. Uh, we thought that's not too onerous. Uh, for Maybe it'll come out of your dear time. Well, actually, not for the freshmen. But, um, <laughs> so we thought that was reasonable to demand. Um, so first of all, students, uh, when they play the game, they have to complete missions. And when they do, they unlock encyclopedia entries. Uh, which disclose information on the French Revolution, uh, what was the third estate, uh, who was Mirabeau in the 16th, and this information is, is good and accurate, so they're quizzed on over 100 uh, database centuries. We also ask students to write a weekly play log and tell what they accomplished, and so for the French majors especially, uh, this gave them lots of writing practice. And indeed, our French uh, capstone seniors, raise your hands. So they played the video game all in French. We switched it so it was in French. So, and we think this is a promising way to teach one language. We also asked students to think about video games as a cultural form, like the novel, film, uh, TV series. Video games have been called the novel of our times, and it was either Slate or Salon, or one of those two. Mm. And uh, you could argue that a cultivated person should be literate in this form. <laughs> mm. So we asked students to ponder, is this art, is Assassin's Creed Unity a masterpiece? And they're confused, but probably not. Mm. Finally. We asked students to think critically as they played the game. Uh, they had to assess what's historical and what's fictional. Uh, they had to think about representation and ideology, issues of gender in video game culture. How come the protagonist is a guy in Assassin's Creed Unity and you can't have a, uh, have a woman? Uh, what are the politics of this game? How are the revolutionaries depicted? Students read various interpretations and schools of thought among historians of the French Revolution, and we asked them to consider which that might have inspired the creators of the game, and uh, to think about why left-wing politicians in France, for example, were so up in arms uh, about this video game. And also to think about violence in video games. Finally, after playing two games, students were assigned a good old-fashioned research paper. Yeah. <laughs> And they received uh, library research training by Robert Schoops and Lindy Scripps Hookstra. Uh, fantastic uh, customized research training for the whole classes. Also lots of individual one-on-one uh, -on -one training. Uh, so what we found is that after these games, uh, students were excited to do research. And they're even excited to hear about each other's research. Uh, and they formed a veritable research team, even the freshmen. Uh, some of the most intrepid of whom are here today to uh, present their research to you. Mm. So does everyone have a ballot? So we, uh, you all can vote for your favorite presentation. We have prizes at the end. Um, so there are three uh, categories of voters uh, divided into three estates, just like in old regime France. So the first district estate is the administration. Mm. Uh, and that includes department chairs, Peter. Uh, the second estate is faculty and staff. And, uh, 
the third estate is everyone else. The students, family, uh, their guests. And now here are the revolutionaries. So uh, the first presenter today is Arielle Stevens. She is a French and history double major. because most of the sources we think about when we think about uh, Robespierre are really negative towards him. And this is the, an example of a source that um, could uh, present him more positively. And it is biased, obviously, because she's writing about her two brothers. But um, the events she, she um, discusses in her memoirs have been corroborated by other sources throughout the years that, that historians have dug up, um, starting even in the 19th century already. So, um, and it, it serves as, as another view of Robespierre that doesn't necessarily justify the reign of terror at all, but it shows the, a more complex vision of um, this very famous, very well-known revolutionary figure whose um, career is um, very debated. The, the um, effects of the reign of terror have been discussed and debated by historians for years. And so that, um, that is why I chose to research this project. Our next presenter is Mason Mathis. He is a senior French major. Uh, he also works at the, should I say, he also works at the YMCA where he is my baby swim teacher. Um, for my final research paper, I plan on writing about the usage of Cartesian philosophy and how one can use this philosophy to. Never heard of it's like, okay. I plan on using Cartesian philosophy, um, the philosophy of René Descartes, to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to frame, and to use as a frame for how we look at the French Revolution. Um, we could probably ask why it's important, because René Descartes came about 150 years before the French Revolution, and there's really not a whole lot linking the two together. Um, in my opinion, I think that Descartes, as one of the founders of modern philosophy, um, proposed ideas that we can find are very evident in the French Revolution from different events and actions that were taken. Um, I'm looking to see the level of influence of René Descartes and I, I'm what I believe is one of the most important events in French history. Um, I will specifically be using his discourse to René Tote, um, his methodology for finding the vérité, the truth. Um, I think this is his principal work and it, it outlines the rules for discovering what is the truth and, and why people, why this book or this work might have been used over other works to look at the French Revolution. Um, the main, the main points of this work outline four rules. Uh, the, the most important, in my opinion, is placing everything in doubt. It's necessary, according to René Descartes, to question everything. Uh, in in, in the to the French Revolution, the biggest thing that was being questioned was authority. You know, why were why were the nobles so powerful? Why did they have so many more delegates even though they represented a smaller quantity of people? And why 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 wasn't why were people not as equal as they should have been when looking at and using reason? René Descartes used reason to to solve this verity to uh, to find this truth. And he argues that reason is found equally among all men. It's not you know, it's not given, it's not Obtained, it's just already there. It's an innate. It's an innate. Going off at this point, you can look at the extreme discontent of the revolutionaries towards the inequality of social classes. Um, we learned a lot about this in our game with regards to the National Assembly and how the clergy 
and the Noble Islands. Uh, okay. Had more delegates than the Chisita, the third estate, which was clearly the larger group and the least represented. And I think by making these connections between Rene Descartes and the French uh, Revolution, we can see if Descartes' philosophy could have, been, could have set in motion ideas that led to the French Revolution. Our next speaker is Jacques Lacan, who is also a senior French major. So my research, um, I focused on the violence in the revolution, and at first I was really interested in the sans culot, um, the men in the streets who, who were having riots and killing, and you know, we also have this image of the French Revolution as heads on pipes and bloody massacres and things like that. Um, so at first I was looking into this really well-known book, The Psychology um, of Revolutions by Gustave Le Bon. Uh, it was very well-known, uh, very much cited, and, and it, he explains um, the mentality of, of men in revolutions and how violence seems to naturally come about with that. Um, and it's just very fascinating. Again, it, um, this concept was widely accepted for years and years. Um, he wrote the book in two, or 1912. And in 2000, uh, there's a historian, Arno Mayer, he wrote a book called Violence and Terror in the French Revolution, and in it, he, he makes a very bold statement. He said, uh, there is no revolution without violence. So, continuing on throughout the years, um, this has still been widely accepted. Uh, this woman, Mary Ashburn Miller, she wrote a book on the natural history of revolution, uh, where she looked at violence linguistically. You know, at the time of the revolution, uh, the encyclopedia had come out, people were having discourse on, on nature and religion and politics, and they were describing nature as, as, as violence and thunderstorms and lightning and, and volcanoes and these, the, the Jacobins, the, the men in the streets, they used these types of words to describe their actions. And uh, Mary Ashburn Miller kind of justifies their actions uh, based on the literature of the time. It's kind of a far stretch, um, but just goes along with the same mentality, violence and revolution. Um, anyway, so I noticed that all of these scholars had talked about the violence in the revolution in terms of big things, the storming of the Bastille, uh, the, the September massacres. Um, and then I came across this book by um, Mika Alto, and it was written last year in 2015, and he actually examined uh, nonviolence in the revolution and how its impact seemed a little bit more uh, prevalent than we really know. Uh, for example, he did cite that 754 Parisian political demonstrations between 1787 and 1795 did take place. Only 12% of those were violent. Um, so he does give some more examples. He says for the big events that we all you know, have heard about, that it, it's really more just they were provoked or they were failing and they didn't know what else to do, that they weren't violent um, originally. Uh, so basically, when it comes down to it, uh, my research ended up concluding with, you know, I think nonviolence in revolution plays a bigger part than most historians and scholars have considered. So I think this really opens the door for more research into nonviolence in revolution, um, not just in history and the past, but also today in the present. So, and that's it. Thank you very much. I should mention that for our French capstone seniors, this is research in progress. Uh, their papers are actually due uh, at the end of finals week. So. Uh, they're they're uh, working on this as we speak. This, this is research under construction. Our next speaker is Jesse Dubridge. Woo -woo. Uh, Jesse is a double major in French and English. He's a senior in French culture. Thank you, Mr. Ike. Julia Bay, Mr. Ike. So my research project is about a minority group that happened to fall on hard times during the revolution. <laughs> they had their property taken from them, and many felt as though they had to emigrate from their country and order, of uh, country of origin, in order to keep some semblance of their pride intact. This minority being, of course, the nobility. <laughs> oh yes, the privileged few. Public enemy number one of the French Revolution, after the National Assembly abolished feudal rights, as well as abolishing all hereditary nobility and the associated privileges, there was a large movement within La Noblesse, wherein many chose to emigrate to Austria or Germany. Yet, while many state that this is a large movement, 
it really only consisted about some 8% of the nobility, some easily 16,000. Uh, but my question was, what of the nobles who didn't emigrate? Those who decided to brave the revolutionary tides? Well, many of the very, very rich simply bought their land back because they had the means to do so. Yet others went down a more unorthodox route by becoming revolutionaries themselves. These noble éclaré, or enlightened nobles, that participated in the revolution often aligned with the moderate fayals. Yet others, such as the character I played in the reacting to the past game, Marie-Jean Hérault de Seychelles, were wildly radical and were fully committed to the fall of the ancient regime. So where did this division come from? From the research that I've conducted thus far, this variation in political philosophies didn't happen by chance or by any means overnight. Uh, the rule used to be you were noble by blood or you were nothing. Throughout the 18th century, this began to change. Many were ennobled due to military prowess or just because they were very, very rich. Oh. Here's where we find the split. The noble, between the nobles by race and the anobri, the ennobled, the nobility had practically doubled over the 18th century. Um, throughout my research, I have been looking at the multitude of variations that existed within the nobility due to its sudden growth in the 1700s. And that's it. Thank you. Next, we shall hear from Monsieur Chris Serpais, who is a double major in French and computer science. So my research project was on Jean Sylvain Bailly and the Champs de Mars and his involvement in the massacre of Champs de Mars. Jean Sylvain Bailly was a philosopher, an astronomer, a leader of the National Assembly, and served as mayor of Dur uh, Paris during the French Revolution until his death with guillotine at the Champs de Mars on November 12, 1793. As a member of Freed Academies, he had made a grave mistake abandoning his scientific career for a political one. Uh, he was decisively charged by the citizens of having conspired to massacre the patriots at the Champs de Mars and was guillotined for his speculated crimes against the state. And I say speculated because nobody really knows what actually happened. So what do historians say about the Champs de Mars? Uh, the king's flight to Varennes caused unrest amongst the citizens. Uh, the National Assembly, the legisl legislative body of the time, declared the king kidnapped instead of a coward. Uh, and so the people felt oppressed by the tyrant known as Louis XVI and had lost all faith in the National Assembly to represent them. Drafted at the Champs de Mars, where the Eiffel Tower now stands, and at the altar of the fatherland is where it was drafted. So here several thousand Parisian patriots gathered to sign the petitions, and two men were found underneath the altar during this time and believed to be conspiring to sabotage the signing. So they were hanged by the crowd. And Bailly, mayor of Paris, and Lafayette, having been ordered to the Champs de Mars to force the crowd to disperse, inevitably declared martial law, which only angered the citizens, obviously. So they threw stones at the soldiers, some of whom were untrained, and thus they began to fire upon the unarmed citizens. According to different accounts, uh, between 12 and 50 citizens were killed or wounded. So historians disagree on the significance of the event and whether or not it was premeditated by Bailly. So according to George Roudet, the event couldn't have been qualified as a massacre, and in the end had little significance on the progression of the revolution at all. Other historians are kind of middle ground, such as J.M. Thompson and the writer of Bailly, Bailly's biography, Francois Argo, who believe that Bailly may not have always been the foresight or, or had the best foresight or intuition, but was not ultimately responsible for his actions, and his execution was legitimate. Uh, Berevi and Barrier um, were extremely critical of the event and his guilt there within, citing letters between Bailly and the former president of the National Assembly that, according to them, proved Bailly had premeditated the event. So my research has been in different accounts of the event from citizens and officials in the National Assembly, and trying to determine whether or not Bailly had really premeditated the, the, the massacre at the Champs de Mars. Had he decided to kill these people in advance and only use the death of those two men as an initiative to cause the massacre? Our next presenter is Andrew Rabuski, who is a senior French major. 
revolutions as independent from each other. Though earlier research, which has stated that Haiti was a uh, subsidiary of the French Revolution, may actually, perhaps, may actually be correct in some sense. Uh, these revolutions, in fact, did interact with each other from the process. The Haitian Revolution officially unfolds in 1791 with the, uh, uh, the march on Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, actually, right after the March on Versailles by the uh, people in France. Uh, however, this movement actually begins at the same time as the uh, French Revolution in France in the year 1789. Uh, this actually began after uh, it was the fall of the Bastille, uh, July 15th, 1781. Uh, both nations took this as a cue that radicalism was spreading. So there was a freedom to, to gain some power that they had lost over both those sides. There's some certain similarities between the two uh, between the populations of the uh, two countries uh, that helped to spark, uh, fire, uh, augment these revolutions, the radicalism, the violence within. Uh, both, both nations had uh, oppressed people, oppressed people by a small uh, a, a small upper class. So in Haiti, we have the um, what's called the Jean de Couleur, and these individuals would be similar to uh, those individuals from. Uh, and the Jacobins, the Foyos, the conservative parties. So they're upper middle class. They were not noblesse. Uh, the Jean de Couleur were actually mixed race individuals. Uh, they identified with both sides, the whites and the slaves themselves. Uh, the, people see, the people of both nations significantly outnumbered the upper class, their oppressors rather. And people are not awarded basic human, basic human rights in either nation. Jean de Couleur, also not awarded basic human rights, such as the right to vote. Um, the, really the only uh, right that they, that they had gained was the right to property. Uh, and overall disenchantment with the Ancien regime, uh, the old regime of France, which was also present in Haiti on the form of French colonies. Uh, as early as 1788, surprisingly, there was an anti-slavery movement that flooded across France. And the people, uh, during this origin of the French Revolution, I identified incredibly strongly with this anti-slavery movement. The noblesse, rather, did not. Uh, this, this society, which began this movement, actually, uh, you guys might know it, called the Amis des Noirs, uh, began over in uh, England a few years prior. Uh, included members from the National Assembly in France, such as Mirabeau, Condorcet, uh, Lafayette, Gonvaspierre, uh, another notable personage, probably the most important of them all, was uh, the Abbey uh, Gregoire. Uh, this individual uh, supported both slavery, the Jean Couleur rights for uh, the people of France, the population of France. Uh, after the Declaration of the Rights of Man, there was uh, uh, th this is this is when the movement began to be rather after the Declaration. Uh, which claimed rights for all civilians. There, there was some, uh, quite a bit of ambiguity within the text itself, uh, particularly, particularly around Article 4, which outlines the rights, uh, the right to vote. Uh, Jean Fleur, in fact, came in front of the National Assembly, which not even the people of France were allowed to speak in front of the assembly itself, and speak to rap or things like that. Uh, so, um, they they, uh, they discuss their they discuss certain issues regarding this article and the right to vote. Uh, Gregoire, one of the members of the National Assembly, supported their decision and tried to spread this through uh, the removal of, of power from the colonial assembly over in Haiti, as well as provide rights right to vote for the people as well as the uh, uh, So what, what's interesting is. Uh, there was, in fact, interaction between these two revolutions, uh, direct and indirect. And that concludes presentation.
presentation by French Capstone Seniors. Now we shall hear from two honors Yoroso freshmen. Serena Geisel is a psychology major. application, 
it says that the highest rates of crime will be in the zone right outside the heart of the city because the people who lived in the city have been pushed out and they will now feel this sense of discontentment and a sense that they don't belong. So I found a map of revolutionary Paris and interestingly enough, the lower class Parisians in the terror lived exactly where this theory says that the highest crime will be. So then I moved on to psychology and mob psychology and the theories that could explain what's going on in their minds that could change how they act. And there's a recent study done by MIT or the Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology that found that when you put two competing groups against each other, they're more likely to inter like act violently and act violently against each other. So biologically, these people, when put against one another, against the nobility, are predetermined that they will be violent because of how their minds work. And so then I looked at the leaders of the terror who led this whole thing. And I found that Maximilian Robespierre used a lot of the same techniques that a lot of politicians today use, and they appealed to the crowd's emotions. And he basically told them that they were already so afraid because the whole world was crumbling, the Catholic Church was falling apart, there were food shortages, and they just needed to be led by someone. And he told them that they could fight and they could go up against this nobility and they could win and change their lives. So when Robespierre did this, he led them into violence and their minds were already weakened by the criminological factors because they were in this location, impoverished, they already resented the nobility. And I found that you really can't blame them for how they acted when all of these factors were put upon them and it was basically out of their control. And when Robespierre led this, it resulted in the slaughter of thousands and the slaughter of thousands because the human mind is unfortunately very easily manipulated. Thank you. And that concludes our presentations. You will confer with your factions, uh, choose your vote for your favorite uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you've got about one minute, and choose. Uh, Choose a spokesperson who will tell uh, why your faction uh, admires that particular presentation so much. One minute. <laughs> Director of the Frederick Meyer Honors College, Gretchen Galbraith, Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, we are the chosen few. <laughs> and the winner is. I'm very pleased to present the views of the noblesse, which of course are the only views that matter. Uh, we, we had uh, quite a difficult time, a uh, number of excellent presentations. We were uh, especially impressed with uh, Serena and Hannah, who basically showed how corrupt and um, base the people are in many ways. Uh, but I'm afraid our award must go to Jesse DeBridge, who properly represented the noblesse in all its ways. Well, as uh, a member of the second estate, our views kind of matter. <laughs> um, I mean, to be honest, you couldn't keep it going without us. But... <laughs> Um, and we uh, also had a very difficult decision to make, and in fact, there were a few people put in the guillotine, guillotine after, uh, you know, or, you know, at least some folks who disagreed with the dominant perspective. Um, but uh, after careful deliberation and some violence, um, we decided to go with uh, Jennifer Hound's presentation. Uh, for uh, for various reasons, she had a clear intervention in the historiographic literature, and um, and cited, of course, a number of um, other historiographic, uh, or I guess other uh, works of history to uh, to create that intervention. And we uh, thought that was particularly impressive for someone who started the semester out disliking history <laughs> and now embracing its methodology. So. <laughs> Uh, thanks to judges from the Second Estate, historian, 
Michael Kuner and historian Stephen Morgan from the History Department. Also librarians who were part of uh, Lindy Skripsutra, Aaron Fisher. Uh, thank you for yeah. oh, and, and Robert Chips. Sorry, thank you for Jerry. Now here's the verdict from everyone else, the third state. <laughs> All right. So as representative of what many would consider the uh, lumpen class, um, <laughs> We decided to go with Hannah Hunter because we felt that her incorporation of modern day theories to explain past events was both seamless and effortless. And her presentation was obviously well organized and very well rehearsed. Fisher, Program Manager of GDSU Libraries for her vision for allowing this to happen. Jeff Chamberlain, Director of the Frederick Meyer Honors College, who uh, makes honors an incubator for trying out the, the most whacked out pedagogies. David Schultz, <laughs> the Director of the Language Resource Center, who's underwritten this project and amazing stuff for the last 10 years. Thank you. Veronica Clapp, Associate Director of the Language Resource Center, who orchestrated all of this beautifully. We're so grateful to her. Where's Veronica? Thank you for all of your massive work. And all the LRC staff, especially Zach Gill, research assistant. Yeah. And he is a convicted adamant Marxist uh, in French Revolution historiography. Mm. Thanks. Was that? Was right. uh, thanks to IT for a significant capital outlay for purchase of consoles, Xboxes, and Playstations and the LRC. Thanks to Professor Ellen Adams, my co-conspirator, and honors you sit. Once again, librarians Lindy Scripps Hookstra for research training, Robert Schiff's research training, and uh, for the idea for this event. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, feel about using video games to teach video games for learning um, in college do you, do you think this well, is a good idea? Here we are in the library cranking video games <laughs> in a place that's supposed to be sacrosanct and quiet <laughs> breaking the rules right yeah so it's a great way to subvert the curriculum okay fight the man so not really subvert it but no I do think that there's a tremendous place for gaming in the curriculum but it's how it's done learning as play kind of lets down your guard and that way you're more you know, you, you learn, you're more open and you're not realizing that you're like, learning.